Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to all of you. Um, before I let Gina introduce the session, I would like to say just a few words as the communication coordinator of the International Simone de Beauvoir Society, because this session is part of the Beauvoir webinar series, which is a project organized by Gina and I for the Society. And I just want to remind you that uh, it is possible for you to join the society, like it, it would be a huge support for us and also for the journal Simone de Beauvoir Studies, uh, because when you become a member, you also get a subscription to the journal and, um, and then members are also registered on our mailing list. So you can find everything about becoming a member about the journal uh, on our website. And you can also follow our activities on social media. I can show you there. So we're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, where we share contents there, but it's also the place where um, our community can express itself since you can send us your questions about Beauvoir, for example, or talk with other Beauvoir specialists, uh, for example. So that's it for now. I just wanted to remind you that the International Simone de Beauvoir Society exists. And uh, the message that we would like to convey to you is that uh, being a member of the society means being part of a large community of people, mainly academics, but not only, who are interested in Beauvoir and her work. Uh, so thank you. I give the floor to Gina and uh, uh, enjoy the, the session. Thank you, Maureen. If we're um, keeping the slides, can we make sure it's in slideshow? Thank you. All right, hello everyone. Good morning from the Philippines to our speakers, guests, and participants from the different parts of the world. Uh, greetings uh, from wherever you are. If you can, please uh, let us know through the chat where you are joining us from and maybe express a um, a message of greetings to everyone um, in the Zoom. Welcome and thank you for joining us once again for another session of the Simone de Beauvoir webinar, especially, especially to the audience based in the Philippines or those from the same time zone for waking up so early or staying up until this time to be able to join this session. It's 5.30 in the morning here, but I and the other Filipinos in this Zoom session wouldn't want to miss this equally significant webinar, a book discussion on a recently published work titled We Are Not Born Submissive, How Patriarchy Shapes Women's Lives, which is a work primarily inspired by the thinking of Simone de Beauvoir. So as Maureen said, this webinar series project conceived in 2020 is organized by yours truly and Marie Rouge for the International Simone de Beauvoir Society in partnership with the Department of Philosophy, Faculty of Arts and Letters, University of Santo Tomas, and from ESPA, University of Toulouse, Jean Jaurès. It aims to continuously propagate to as many audiences as possible the conversations on the works and thoughts of Simone de Beauvoir as we see still very relevant until the present time. So last January, uh, we're, we were grateful to Sylvie Le Bon, and, uh, Le bon de Beauvoir for gracing us with their presence for our first webinar for this year. And for this second session, we are fortunate to be graced by the presence of no less than the author of a significant work on feminist philosophy and Beauvoir scholarship and two other guests in conversation with her who will be introduced shortly. Let me first talk about the book um, bearing the, a powerful title, We Are Not Born Submissive, How Patriarchy Shapes Women's Lives. This work, published in 2021 for its English translation, is a philosophical study on female submission, a subject that is both central and little theorized in feminist philosophy. Simone de Beauvoir has produced the very first philosophical exploration of it. And the author draws on the second sex to, pro to propose a contemporary analysis to and uh, to go back to what it means for a woman to be submissive in a patriarchal society. We Are Not Born Submissive also anchors on more recent works in feminist philosophy, epistemology, and political theory. In this work, the author argues that to comprehend female submission, we must invert how we examine power and see it from the woman's point of view. 
this and many more arguments will be explored in the discussion of the author with two other special guests. Now, if you want to purchase the book, the code GAR30, capital GAR30, will give you 30% off if you order through Princeton UP's website through 3 slash 31. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce our guests for this session. Our main speaker, as mentioned, is the author of the book to be discussed today. She is an assistant professor of philosophy at Yale University as of yet. Uh, her primary research is in political philosophy, feminist philosophy, moral philosophy, and philosophy of economics. She also works on questions in 20th century French philosophy, critical theory, philosophy of social sciences, and phenomenology. Her first book, We Are Not Born Submissive, was first published in French in 2018. And she then eventually authored an English version published in Princeton University Press. Thanks for that. It has also been translated in German and Spanish and translations in Japanese, Korean, Chinese, and Turkish, and maybe eventually Filipino uh, are underway. In this book, she draws on Beauvoir's philosophy of submission as developed in The Second Sex. Let us welcome Manon Garcia. Hi, Hello. everyone. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm very grateful um, to Marine and Gina for organizing this and in general for the um, Simone de Beauvoir Society for their fantastic work. I, I'm very lucky that there were a lot of people and mostly women before me who wrote a lot of scholarship on Beauvoir on the basis of which I discovered Beauvoir and learned to work on Beauvoir. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I see a lot of your names in the, um, in the participants list. So I'm a bit intimidated, but I'm very happy to be here. We're excited to uh, listen to the discussion, Manon. Thank you. She will be joined by two other Beauvoir scholars, Ellie Anderson and Felipe Melo Lopez. Uh, so Ellie Anderson is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Pomona College in Claremont, California, USA. She writes about selfhood and the philosophy of love, post-World War II French philosophy, especially phenomenology, existentialism, and feminism. Her articles on existentialism, phenomenology, and feminist philosophy have been published in venues, including the Continental Philosophy Review, Hypatia, and the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. She co-hosts with David Peña Guzman and produces the public philosophy podcast titled Overthink, which goes by the tagline, big ideas are within everyone's reach. Couldn't get enough listening to their discussions, which are light and substantial and we get so much uh, takeaway from. Thanks, Ellie, for the enthusiasm you exude in your podcast episodes. And we will, I will definitely keep listening. So that's Ellie Anderson. Of course, last but not the least is Filippo Melo Lopez, a lecturer in philosophy at, uh, uh, at the University of Edinburgh, UK, where she researches feminist philosophy, sexual ethics, and social philosophy. Her recent publications include Bavarian Analysis of Incel Violence and the hashtag MeToo Phenomenon. I read this work on incel violence and speaks interesting analysis on the phenomenon using Bavar as a lens. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Manon Garcia, Ellie Anderson, and Felipa Melo Lopez, thank you for accepting our invitation. I now yield the floor to you for the book discussion. Thanks so much for having us. Um, yeah, really happy to be here. Philippe, I know we're going to do some question and answer, right? Um, do you want to go for it? And we can kind of, yeah, just start our conversation with Manon. How are you? How would you like to go about it? Yeah, um, I so I was sort of I had some questions. Um, I don't know if you want do you want to sort of do it more like question and answer or do you, you want to sort of talk a little bit? Maybe I talk a little bit mm -hmm. and then we sort of go into um into a more sort of informal question and answer that does that sound okay cool 
yeah so maybe i'll i'll just i'll just say some things um first so i'm really thrilled to be here i just want to first thank um uh marine and gina for organizing the the series um and for inviting me to participate in this question i'm really really delighted to be here i, I read manon's book um earlier years ago in french and and it was just like a really great thing to to revisit now um and just so um uh so rich to sort of go back to and think about um so I guess I just want to like start off with a, a little, maybe a, a, a little um, antidote that might be sort of interesting um, to sort of bring out how um, how much of the book I thought was extremely, um, extremely up to date and extremely important. So actually, I teach feminist philosophy at the University of uh, Edinburgh right now. And um, one of my students approached me um, uh, earlier this year about writing an independent project on um, uh, feminist philosophy. And he wanted to write about women and sexual submission. So I thought this was a really interesting thing to, 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 to think about, to read. So the proposal, you know, argued that um, there was uh, a desire for sexual submission uh, that was, quote, too pervasive, right, uh, to conclude that women endorsed it simply because they wanted to sort of um, negotiate gender norms or because they were driven by some form of social anxiety. So my that end quote right so my student found that this was a, like a pervasive desire in popular podcasts made by women best-selling books written by and for women and uh that you could see this on academic research on women's psychology and these were all examples of women um in western societies where you know he thought they lived large life largely quote, uncommanded by men. I thought that was an interesting expression. And so um, in light of this, my student really wanted to develop an account of how gender relations could be sort of not hierarchical, but respecting what he saw as kind of a fixed um, fact, which was, in his words, a sex-specific desire for submission, um, end quote there, that women seem to have. So. I mean, you might be inclined to dismiss this young man as a sort of clinging to some kind of misogynistic cliche, but over the last couple of years in my classes, I've heard young women um, saying things that sound very similar, saying that, you know, things that feminists label as oppressive feel really good, and therefore they can't be bad. And this goes for sexual submission, expensive and elaborate skincare and hairstyling routines, for dreaming of motherhood as the ultimate life fulfillment, or for dating sort of um, older men in a transactional way. I mean, these are all things that sort of have come up. And so um, I think Manon, Manon's book is just so important because it speaks precisely to this, to what my students and I think lots of other people are wrestling with these ambiguities and contradictions um, that plague like contemporary um, feminist thinking and feminist experience. Um, I think that We Are Not Born Submissive really uh, was a, a, a great book to read because it centers the elephant in the room and, and really talks about um, this enthusiastic and active involvement in patriarchal social practices that is such a complicated thing um, for uh, women to address in their uh, practical lives, but for feminists to address from an explanatory perspective. Um, so let me just say, I won't sort of go into, um, I think it'll come out some of the things that were sort of, that in, are in the book, but I'll, I'll just say a few things about what I thought was so, um, impressive to me and remarkable about the book. And I think the one one of the things that I, I want to highlight is that this is a book that takes feminist philosophy really seriously from the very start. It's standing very comfortably on the shoulders of its predecessors and sort of aiming to 
really advance further and tackle, tackle these really difficult questions. Um, and that's a kind of intellectual ambition that I find very admirable. Um, it's also committed to taking women's experience really seriously. And I think that's something we don't see um, that often when this kind of experience contradicts kind of easy party lines or, or neat theories that we might have. And it's also a really demanding book for its readers because it um, centers the kind of everyday behaviors that we don't really take to be um, important to reflect on or think about. Um, the lives of women who don't take themselves to be inferior to men, who live in conditions of legal and political equality, the kinds of things that you might sort of think are, there's nothing to see here uh, from a feminist perspective. And in fact, there's um, a whole lot. I think this is also a book that highlights the theoretical potential of a distinctively Beauvoirian feminism, and we'll, we'll probably sort of get into that as well. Um, I think it both mounts a very important defense of Beauvoirian methodology um, and puts Beauvoirian conversation with, you know, Judith Butler, Catherine McKinnon, but also Rousseau and Freud and Sprivak. And um, I found that really illuminating. But it also, uh, also um, uh, does interpretative work here, I think, in um, bringing together uh, and piecing together uh, a bunch of really complicated and underexplored parts of Beauvoir's work, spanning the ethics of ambiguity, her autobiographical writing, and of course, the second sex. So I, I have a few um, sort of critical questions um, and maybe I'll just sort of uh, uh, throw them out there and see what we can make of it um, uh, in our conversation. So I have like three, three questions and, and hopefully there'll be jumping off points for more. Um, so the first question that I had, um, I know is sort of about a tension that seems to um, emerge from the book and from the uh, analysis of submission in the book. So you might think there's a tension between the kind of understanding of submission as something that is not forced that starts the book off and an analysis of submission that involves invokes something like force um, later on. So at the beginning of the book, submission is this philosophical problem that creates like an explanatory impasse because it involves an apparent contradiction. It seems to be a case of an agent sort of surrendering her agency. Um, and I think Manon brings out very helpfully um, this, this thorniness, the problem here, um, by contrasting the figure of the submissive woman with that of the defeated warrior who submits as a last resort. Now, for some women, um, may, there may be situations uh, that are so constrained, they're like more like defeated warriors, right? It's submission to patriarchal rule or death for them. Um, but these are not the cases that pose the kind of worry animating we are not born submissive. Um, as Manon puts it, uh, the problem is understanding why women who could choose freedom choose submission. So the kind of submission the book is analyzing is one that is uh, far from being last resort, so really uh, complicated to, to think about. Um, it's the one that's surprising, philosophically sort of puzzling. And so by the end of the book, we get an analysis of submission in terms of Beauvoir's um, notion of destiny, right? Um, where there's this idea that there's a, a consent to a destiny, right? Imposed on women. Um, that is different from saying that women are sort of choosing submission. Um, so my question is whether this analysis isn't reducing some of the puzzling phenomenon of the submissive woman to the more familiar and maybe less troubling phenomenon of the vanquished warrior. Sort of how to think about that difference here um, still holding uh, with the analysis of submission that we get with this Beauvoirian analysis of submission that we get in the book. Um, I also have a question. I'm, I also, I'll just throw these questions and then see, see which one uh, you'd like to reply to. Um, so I also have a question about the ethical dimension of submission. 
So the, the main project of the book is one of understanding and explaining, not of prescribing and judging, but the question of women's submission, submission's ethical status comes up, especially in light of Beauvoir's ethics of freedom. And um, the answer in, uh, that we get towards the end of the book is that there's something about here the 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 submission of the the submission of women that um, is responsive to the costs and benefits that structure women's upbringing and existence in the world. So um, there is a rationality to what women are doing, and this is supposed to um, dispel the idea that this would be a sort of immoral thing to do. That submission would be an immoral thing to do. So um, I'm just interested in thinking more about this question in light of the kind of um, examples that you know, I was sort of thinking about uh, emerging from discussions with my students, right? So making yourself more feminine can make people more attracting, attracted to you and taking up the lion's share of the household labor can sort of maintain conjugal harmony. Um, all of this is very understandable and very rational, but isn't there something wrong um, with um, maybe um, responding to the world's incentives in this way or not being willing to, to bear some costs? And finally, I just wanted to, to ask and to invite Manon to uh, say a bit more about the, the framing device of the book, which I thought was uh, really interesting, the, the Me Too movement and its, and its aftermath. I think it's a really interesting thing to, to think about. We're four years out since the Weinstein scandal first broke. And I know Manon, you've been writing and thinking more about it. Um, the contradictions involved in women's submission really became very tangible with the reactions to Me Too cases. Um, and it seems to me that um, Me Too has uh, also brought out the, the mundane character, as you put it, of, of women's submission, just in sheer number of testimony, anonymous and, and not anonymous. So I was wondering what you think about what has Me Too done to our public life and to the situation of women right, uh, in societies like the United States, has it called feminine submission into question um, or is um, women's situation still very much the same? Um, so, I mean, I, I just wanted to, to, to end by this sort of beginning um, uh, intervention by just saying that I think this is a really agenda setting book um, that I hope will really shape um, the, the future of feminist philosophy. Um, submission is a kind of important uh, theoretical piece of the puzzle for understanding the perpetuation of patriarchal social relations, but it's also a really salient contradiction in the lives of you know, young people like my students who are really passionate about feminist causes, right? But enmeshed in a world structured by um, hierarchy. And um, yeah, these are theoretical and practical questions that I think are really urgent. Uh, and that um, the, you know, we're not born submissive puts at the center of feminist philosophy, which is exactly where I think they should be. So I'll, I'll stop there and um, hand it over to Ellie. Thank you. Um, I'm sure Manon, you're like jumping to, you have thoughts on how to respond. So maybe I'll try and keep this quick, but just to uh, say similarly to Philippa, some of the things that I found really interesting about the book and then raise um, one or two questions to start. So I, I think the book is beautifully written and it was really a joy to read. I think one of the one of the great parts about our jobs is that the line between reading for pleasure and reading for work is um, often blurred, but it's certainly not always blurred. <laughs> and this was a situation where it was very much blurred for me, just like really, really enjoying reading this book. I think you do a particularly excellent job um, for those who are unacquainted with some of the philosophical traditions that you're working with to situate them. So as somebody who is familiar with the traditions you're working with, I still really enjoyed your descriptions of them. Um, and got out a lot out of them. But I also think that this book is really accessible for people who aren't familiar with phenomenology, with the Hegelian background of some of Beauvoir's work, with the feminist literature that you're drawing on. And so I think it's just, a, it does a really, really good job of situating the argument relative to existing traditions, um, some of which Philippa had mentioned as well. And I think that just makes it enjoyable for a really wide variety of different readers. Um, I think, 
you know, one of the, one of the things I enjoy about the book too, is that it, is in line with a lot of the recent thrust of Beauvoir scholarship in the past couple of decades of showing how Beauvoir is robustly situated within the phenomenological method and is creating an original contribution to that method. And so I think you're, you're really adding to scholarship on her phenomenological method, especially relative to feminist philosophy as a way to get out of the impasse of on the one hand, gender essentialism and um, overemphasizing biology and physiology, but then on the other hand, overemphasizing a strong social constructionism that for reasons you point out in the book is um, problematic from a Beauvoirian perspective. And so how do we make sense of the fact that um, there are women in the world and that to be a woman means to be submissive um, in most contexts as you ooh, argue? I just dropped my book because I was gesturing <laughs> out of excitement. So I'll pick it up in a sec. Um, but then I think also showing that to say that there is a situation of women um, and to kind of boldly make an even universalizing claim about that in the book. Um, you do that while also not saying that that is fixed, of course, and showing that Beauvoir's phenomenological method encourages us to think about the body as a site of historical sedimentation. And that means that we can also change the destiny of women. And so thinking about submission as the destiny that is presented to women, but not as women's actual destiny. And of course, I mean, the originality of submission as a, as a, sort of theme of conceptual analysis, I think is uh, very much needed in feminist philosophy today. And so I agree with Philippa in saying that this is an agenda setting book. And I think in particular um, with respect to opening up questions of submission, I think there's a lot of ways that the book intersects with um, other recent work in feminist philosophy, especially in feminist love studies about trying to explain why heterosexual relationships are often so disempowering for women, even exploitative of women without, um, you know, sort of without some of the trappings of the external dependencies that many women have historically had. Um, and so how is it that in a seemingly equal society in many ways, these heterosexual love relationships continue to exploit women? Um, and I think focusing on submission is, is really such an original take there. And you point out that it's such an awkward and uncomfortable idea, <laughs> both for feminists who uh, might find themselves in the strange position of saying that women are desiring and perpetuating their own oppression. And then also for philosophy, because for philosophy, there is a paradox uh, in explaining submission or maybe even a a contradiction seemingly, right? Where uh, if humans are free, then how could we find ourselves in a situation where we are abdicating that freedom, freely abdicating that freedom? Um, one of the questions that came up for me in reading this is the status of passivity and activity. And so how do we think about uh, submission as something that, seems to be not actively chosen, but is also not forced to use the, the word that Philippa mentioned. And so um, you describe submission as an activity in passivity in chapter one. And then later in the book, you talk about how submission is not a choice, but something that women consent to. So I'm just curious to push a little bit on that. What does it mean to say that it's something that women consent to without it being a choice? And what does it mean to say that it is something that is not quite active, but maybe not quite fully passive either? And I think part of the motivation in my asking that is I think Beauvoir as a phenomenologist has challenging and original ideas about the very status of passivity and activity, because as a philosophy of embodiment, phenomenology resists binaries between activity and passivity. One of the things that you note in your book is um, Beauvoir's claim about making oneself passive or making oneself into an object, that notion of se faire objet that I know Jennifer McQueenie, who's here, has been working with a lot lately um, in really interesting ways. How do we turn ourselves into a passivity or turn ourselves into, uh, like, with, without that being necessarily active, I suppose. And um, one other element, I think, just to, to add to that is, how can we think about this relative to what the Marxists would call false consciousness or what Beauvoir would call mystification? Um, why is, is submission the sort of behavior that echoes 
mystification. You describe submission as an attitude. And so that makes me think that maybe there's an extent to which we might think of mystification as synonymous with submission. But it also seems that submission has a more kind of active or at least behavioral component than mystification. Um, yeah, and I take mystification for Beauvoir to be, to be pretty synonymous with false consciousness. Thank you. Thank you so much to the both of you. Um, it means a lot for me that we're discussing my book, the three of us. Um, not so much because, um, well, I'm gonna say why it means so much is because I have an enormous respect for all the women before us, but I'm also extremely excited that we're, a new group that is building on their work. And I think it's it's really exciting to see that I think the three of us we come from different kinds of um, traditions of doing philosophy and we all arrive at Beauvoir and at how central her philosophy is for us, for the different questions we have in mind. I, I think like I met uh, Philippa on a, like as a respondent to her paper on masculinity, I was well on incels and I was writing about masculinity and and I think in my work I also work on love and and your it was very funny because one of my students this week told me I really want to work on like how Boba helps us think about non-monogamy. And I was like, I think you should look at Ellie Anderson's work. And so I'm I'm very excited that we can sit on the shoulders of these big women who preceded us and, and try to do Beauvoir work um, together. And I think in a way, in retrospect, I find myself guilty to some extent to have pretended a little bit too much that submission was a, a new question for feminists. And I think what I meant by that, that has been that, that I didn't explain clearly enough is that I thought the concept of submission had not been used enough. But of course, it's a core issue of feminist philosophy. I mean, I, I, and I take it that this is the reason why I went back to the second sex. And, but I still wanted to say this because I see how in our careers we're forced to talk about how novel everything we do is and in a way what I'm trying to do is more to think of like like the French would say penser notre monde so not exactly to think about our world but think our world uh, with Beauvoir and um, and I think that responds a bit to your question uh, uh, Philippa about me too and for me, it was so bizarre because I defended my dissertation three months before Me Too at a time where, you know, everyone was telling me, oh, you work on feminism. That's kind of uh, like, it doesn't interest anyone, but okay, good for you. Do whatever you want. And and then Me Too happened. And um, in, in France, it was, I think even more than in the US, a uh, deflagration in the sense that French people have been very good at closing their eyes at the at the sexual problems of France, and so um, that's how this book came to be. I initially I really wanted to publish my dissertation as a whole, and then I really thought, okay, like there is this Me Too thing going on, and I have some tools that I could provide, and for some of the Bavarians here. I also, they, they would know that. I also felt like, well, in France, she's still not seen as a philosopher. So I could take this sudden interest in feminism in order to help bring her to the philosophical scene in France. And I think it's one of the things that I'm really proud of because I really think it worked. And for those who know, those of you who don't know, she's now, in the program, in the list of the authors for high school students in philosophy in France. And it was not the case. And it, it, it ended up being the case in 2020. So it's, it's, um, it's new and it's great. Um, but it's true that 
I think you're right, Philippa, about how Me Too has done to, like, Me Too has highlighted the submission of women. And in a certain way, I feel like we're in these moments in the history of feminism where there's the most hope, like the, the most possible optimism and pessimism at the same time. Um, on the one hand, when I see my students and I, I think the both of you must have the, the same experience, I feel like, oh, wow, they're so much more advanced than I was at their age about thinking about all of this. They have so many tools at their disposal um, and, and they're so not accepting any of the things that I was accepting at their age and I'm not that old. So I, um, I have a lot of optimism about this. And at the same time, I know that he's really persona non grata, but there are some parts of the novelist Michel Houellebecq's work that I really like. And I think his uh, book called Submission is actually fantastic because it is, well, it's fantastic in some regards. I think there are some Islamophobia in it, even though I don't think, I, I disagree with a lot of the accusations on Islamophobia because I take him to be saying that a lot of men will be so happy to side with each other if what is at stake is women's submission and that if they can get women back in the house and in the home and, and exclude women from public life, they, they will side together. And I think we've seen that to some extent with Trump and we're seeing that right now with Zemmour in France. And, and so I'm, I'm both, I, I think it's true that Me Too really brought feminism forward, but I also think that the backlash is really uh, constantly threatening women. So I, I don't know, yeah. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about this. But I think one of the questions that you both raised is about this question of knowing if submission is forced or not. Um, and I think, and, and which, which intertwines with the question of activity and passivity, I think what I wanted to say in the book is that it is not always, for, that it can be forced, um, but I think forced submission is in a way not even submission anymore in what I'm interested in with submission. You know, because some people tell me, oh yeah, you, you work on domestic violence. And no, I don't work on submission, uh, domestic violence because domestic violence victims are in a situation where sometimes there are choices to be alive tomorrow or not. And, and so you can't really have an, a moral evaluation of their submission because it's a, it's a life and death matter and, and it's very clear that their moral responsibility in the matter is almost a zero, contrary to what some people think. But what I'm interested in is precisely the type of submission where there is some form of activity. Um, and so activity has at on two levels. First of all, what I was interested in, which is like the core, of course, the core citation of the second sex that my book talks about is the same as what Jen McQueenie works on is the question of se faire objet, which is what I'm interested in is that women's submission partly is grounded on women's actions in order to look like they're passive. And I take it that it's actually a lot of work and that's what the second sex shows us, but also popular culture today, like all these things. If you take the YouTube makeup videos, um, the lunch boxes, YouTube videos, like how to prepare the best possible lunch box for your kids. The new, um, I, I found out also about these um, 
you know, cleaning videos on YouTube, like these women who gi give the best tips to have the best possible clean house. And then the trad wife videos about how to take good care of your husband. We, sh we see through all these videos, the, the um, we could say the technique, because I, I'm not sure it's an art in the sense of, but, but there is a, a technical com and, and competence and a project invested. It is really an activity, but it is an activity that has something paradoxical that Bobo showed of eliminating the negative and, and not creating anything. And, and so that's the first level on which I was interested to challenge the opposition between activity and passivity in saying the perfect, most submissive stay at home mom is someone who works 20 hours a day. And that seems completely contradictory, but I think we need before we can have an ethical evaluation and a political evaluation of submission, we need to see that to submit is to work towards submission in a certain way, to be slim, to be pretty, to be well-dressed, to be that there's so much work. And then I think there's a, a second level of activity, which is the um, agency of submission. So how do we, is there a choice that we make or are we purely constrained? And here, my ambition that, uh, I mean, it's a fine line, but what I find Beauvoir so powerful for and what I'm trying to do in my own work is to, to find a way to understand limited autonomy, both from a structural perspective and from an individual perspective. And so that, that um, links to your question about false consciousness. I feel like in my book, I was tempted to say, oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm just not talking about, like this has nothing to do with false consciousness. Of course, that's not exactly what I think. I think that of course, a big part of what's going on in women's submission has to do with ideology, with social norms and with the way the ways in which ideology and social norms create blind spots in our perspective and in our agency. But what I wanted to say is that I think we need to take seriously the possibility that women know very well that, or that a lot of women know very well that may not be great to play by the rules of femininity and that what they're doing is actually playing by the rules of femininity and yet they still do it. And so that's, that's more what I was interested because I think the, if you adopt the false consciousness analysis, if you think all these women are mystified, it's a bit too easy, right? You, you just need to have a structural approach of saying, well, we just need to, to um, fight patriarchy as a social structure. But what is really scary, I think, is that, and, and that's what we see in the post Me Too times is, and, and what Felipe was saying about her students, that actually there are some materially very free women who still play those roles of femininity and and so my question was, what is their agency? What is the part of choice? Are we, and, and I wanted to avoid on the one hand, the sort of extremely sexist view that either that it's women nature, so they have no moral responsibility, but they're inferior beings because they don't want to be free or the sexist view that it's just that they like it. And so, if there are terrible consequences, it's a sort of like luck egalitarianism of like, sorry for you. Like if you have terrible preferences, then you're responsible for the outcomes of your terrible preferences. And I wanted to say something along the lines of when you talk to, when you take women's experiences seriously, you see that 
both that they both know that they could do things differently that what is going on with them is often not a great situation and that they're not perfectly free to do things differently and and so i think that's where i was interested that it's something like they're not completely in false consciousness. They're aware that something bad is going on, yet they still do it. And so that's why I made this distinction that may be more clear in French between um, choice and consent, because I take it that in everyday language, when, when we say that we consented to something, it means that we made a choice, but a sort of second degree choice that we were offered something and we made the choice of not opposing it. And, you know, like your a sort of basic thing would be, I, someone says, um, how about we go to this party? You didn't choose to go to the party, but you don't say no. So you're like, yeah, let's, let's roll with this. And I think that's the image we have about sexual consent, which is, so problematic because it implies that it's always men who propose. And, but I thought this distinction was efficient in showing that it's not that women, it's not like uh, Rousseau seems to think that women uh, wake up in the morning and they're like, how about I give up on my freedom? But more something like society tells them you should really give up on your freedom or you should really not be free. And they're like, Okay, and so I take it that there is some form of activity here because you don't actively resist in the name of your freedom, etc. But it's not the same agency as choosing something like you choose to have tea, you know. Yeah, if I could just follow up on that quickly, because I think that opens up a lot of avenues for thinking. Um, I guess I wonder how we might think about that in Beauvoirian terms, though, because I think you're absolutely right about those sort of ordinary language differences between choice and consent. But I take it that for Beauvoir, even when we're consenting to something, we're still choosing it from the existentialist perspective. And at least in the ethics of ambiguity, I, I think as I read it, the one way that we get out of culpability for our decisions is if we are in a situation of oppression that is characterized by mystification. So if we say that submission is not a case of mystification, why is it not then automatically a matter of choice? Because if I'm not mystified, I'm at least aware of my freedom. Yeah, so that's a very good question. I'm, I'm currently teaching a, a Bova seminar and, and the, um, I reread Pierre and Sinas and the Ethics of Ambiguity. And I really think she changes her view between, so clearly between Pierre and Sinas and the Ethics of Ambiguity, where there is a rupture, like she, she doesn't agree with Sartre anymore about what bad faith is. But I take it that even between the Ethics of Ambiguity and the Second Sex, I think she adopts a view in which your moral responsibility is gradual rather than a yes and no dummy. That of course, like the, um, the modern fr like free woman, like us three, for instance, um, we're not in the situation of what she describes of the uh, slave or the woman in the harem. Like, no matter how orientalist and problematic these comparisons are, but of like mystified people who have no way to exert their freedoms. But I take it that in the second sex, a lot of the women she thinks about and, and describes, et cetera, are not either in that situation. They have some degree of choices and, and more than, than all of them, the independent woman. But even in her novels, like you see, I, I think that even La Femme Rompue, she has some choices. She's not fully mystified. She could, you, you see that, I feel like you feel how 
irritated Boba is with those characters precisely because she thinks they're not fully mystified. And, and so that's the point where I'm interested to look at what's going on, that it's not clear cut. Can I, can I ask a question then, um, sort of building up on this and, and going back to some of what you said earlier about submission being a novel or not novel sort of um, question. I mean, it does, it does strike me that Beauvoir is such an interesting thinker to think with about these matters because she's like a thinker of a changing time, right? And of a time where um, she's sort of seeing women's situation change very rapidly um, in, you know, basic legal terms. And what we're sort of, uh, what we're seeing is that submission and something like the question, the, the, the question of submission that you're interested in becomes more and more sort of, um, sort of is being revealed more and more as time sort of progresses, right? And as you were saying, the, what we're finding now is we're, we're having these conversations about um, women uh, men and, and, and gender relations in a in a um, a context where feminist thinking and and feminism even as a political identity has never been as popular as it is today, right? Um, so I'm just curious to th what what do you think is happening when people young people for example, don't just, uh, or, or even older people, when, when you have, for example, these discussions inside the feminist movement, right, about, um, that are phrased not as a, about certain practices, um, be it, you know, various kinds of dis self-disciplining practices, um, right, or things to do with sort of love and relationships. I mean, I, I, um, I was sort of made aware about a whole sort of uh, discussion last when I was when I last fall about like transactional dating right and sort of transactional dating practices which you think is like a really old discussion or a really old sort of trope but is something that um, I found sort of there was a renewed interest on like TikTok and things like that. Um, the the discussion now is not one the, the sorry the 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 way in which this is being cast now is not a, a sort of as a sort of social norm with which people are sort of going along right um, but something like hey look this is this is empowering right um, I mean we've seen this this kind of move for a while but I was particularly interested to see it this. Uh, being applied to something like being uh, a sh having a sugar daddy, right, um, which is sort of what was was being done. Um, and there, I mean, are we sort of getting from these sort of empowerment debates? Are we getting from, say, the sort of a, a, a consent to doing what is normative in one's community to something more like now we're in the kind of modes of self-deception that Beauvoir might be sort of more critical of. So yeah, so I think that's a, that's a very good question. I, I take it that the world we're living in is disproving Beauvoir because in, in the, because she thought that contraception would solve a lot of issues and that free control of women's reproductive power would solve a lot of issues. And I'm not saying that we're there, like I know that this is still not the case, but even in the, in the worlds where women are very free to have the sex that they wanna have without bearing burdens of unwanted children and, there's still something going on. And, and I, I think that Beauvoir was kind of thinking that would dissolve itself. Um, and so that I find very interesting, but it's true that there is this whole um, debate, you know, like um, 
is Lady Gaga a feminist? And then uh, like Nancy uh, Bauer asked, but then the big question was Beyonce, right? That for me, Beyonce is so interesting because on the one hand, she's this super powerful woman. She makes billions of dollars. She's so beautiful, so strong. But then she also publishes albums about how her husband cheats on her and how like she's so sad but she's staying with him and and she's playing the game of a certain femininity and I think there are of course like very big racial questions going on but in the whole feud about Lana Del Rey you know that I, I like of course like it interested me specifically so I think everyone forgot but me but there was a whole thing where Lana Del Rey accused a lot of women of color especially of um, promoting a sort of um, women can do it all narrative and she was saying well I just talk about women who keep making terrible choices and devoting themselves to men who treat them super badly and um and uh, I'm not romanticizing it I'm just talking with what I know which is I know a big part of women's lives and I thought that was so interesting because there was this sort of um putting into question the truth of these self-disciplining uh, practices and saying at the end of the day, we're really like, you can read it as her saying, we're really like the Trotskyite in the um, introduction of the second sex, who's doing all of this, but at the end she's doing it for love and for heterosexual love and in the name of heterosexual love and of heterosexual views on of femininity as submission and um so yeah I I think that's the that's the core well that's the issue that I'm really interested in and it's interesting that you're saying because I agree with you obviously that Boba has something specific to say about this because the way I did my dissertation I mean, maybe it doesn't interest in anyone, so I'm going to uh, go fast on this, but I had decided to work on women's submission before I had seriously read Boba. So I had read Boba at 17 and I didn't understand much and I read it alone thinking that like I, yeah, I had not done philosophy. I didn't know what I was doing, but I started this dissertation and I did it the very French way. So I. I both read, on the one hand, Rousseau, Hegel, um, or like La Boétie, like the political philosophy about servitude and, and domination. And on the other hand, I read McKinnon and li liberal feminism. And then I stumbled upon Nancy Bauer's work. And I was like, oh, it looks like Bova is talking about some of the questions I'm interested in. And I read the second sex. And I remember feeling devastated. I was like, this is better than anything I could have ever said about submission. Uh, so everything I had in mind has already been done and way better than me. And it's actually a, like one of the most important books of philosophy. And so I think that's kind of what I ended up doing, evaluating what worked and didn't work and how Bova could work for understanding this very actual question I had. And so sometimes I'm frustrated by the reception of the book because some not always very well um, meaning people are saying, oh, it's nothing but a poor rewriting of the second sex. And, um, and of course, like, or, or she's just summarizing the second sex. And, that's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to think about the problem of women's submission. And I think the second sex is a very good way to think about it and to and, and that Bova scholarship is helping me to find ways to think about it. But I think it's just a 
perspective on the second sex that you saying that the second sex is a book about why women submit to men is not what everyone reads in the second sex. Ali or Pipa, do you have other questions or should we uh, look at the... Yeah, I wasn't sure if we should move straight to that. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, or Elian, wanna... Elian, Philippa, if you I have, have I have a couple others, but I'm also happy to defer to, um, to the chat or to Philippa if you have something. I was just waiting for Marine if... if, uh, if... Yeah sort of keeping track of time better than us. Yeah, you, you, you can have, uh, you can ask a few other questions during 20 minutes if you want, and then we can take the question from the audience. But if you want to go straight to the question from the audience, we can do that also. Yeah. It's up to you. I, I think giving the audience a little more time than just the just the last yeah. few would be nice. But um, maybe I'll just jump in and add one other thing that um, I, I think really comes out in the book. And so for those who might not have read, might not uh, know this aspect of, of Manon's argument so much, but there is all of this stuff about the pleasure that women take in submission as well, right? And your claim that just because women take pleasure in it, that doesn't mean that it's good for them. And I think that you really interestingly uh, draw on Beauvoir's ethical work where she says that there's a real distinction between a subjective sense of happiness and justice. And you also bring in the work of Amartya Sen on that point. Um, and so I guess I'd be curious to just hear a little bit more too about how the pleasure does not correspond to justice. Because one thing that I was thinking about was that, well, sure, women take pleasure in their submission, but at least in many cases, I, I wouldn't claim in all, I think, for instance, like the case of um, BDSM sexual practices would be an obvious exception to this. But if I think about like the lunch boxes or, or um, the, the YouTube videos, I actually really need the cleaning videos. I'm happy you mentioned that. I could, I could use some <laughs> cleaning videos in my life, but, um, but you know, with like the lunchbox videos, like taking all this time to create a lunchbox, could that not then sort of uh, turn over into a displeasure or a dissatisfaction, because I think in, in her account of devotion, Beauvoir is really clear that the felt sense of happiness in devotion often translates into a felt sense of pain as well. Yeah, um, so that's interesting, because I think just a, a quick word about the um, lunchbox videos. What I'm also interested in is why lunchbox videos and makeup tutorials are not art but um cooking videos by chefs are art and why so i think when you look at these lunch boxes these women i mean it's really uh it's incredible it's like such a level of like trying to have the perfect healthy meal but also making it appealing etc but where it becomes a problem is that you know if you especially if you've been a parent in america that this comes with a whole like you know that part of the lunchbox is the competition with the other moms about who's going to be the best mom and about of course shaming the moms who don't have the time to devote to this and you see it it's like all these things about the the schools who suddenly ask that you send a, a, a cake that is this and that way and that it has to be a home cooked cake and that you absolutely can't buy a cake from and so all of this you see that in general it's not a problem to be great at doing lunch boxes the problem is that the way, the meaning that it has socially is to enforce a form of femininity where you can't have time for your own things. You need to devote all your creativity to things that will be eaten very fast. And, and so I think, um, I think Bova, I don't know if you'll remember, there's this passage, this passage in the second sex where she says, uh, 
uh, she talks about the woman who cooks and who makes these perfect meals. And she says, uh, uh, on ne sait plus si uh, les frites sont pour le mari ou le mari est pour les frites. Uh, if the, the husband is for the fries or if the fries are for, uh, if the husband, uh, if the fries are for the husband or the husband for the fries. And I think that's, that's very interesting, but this is, um, yeah, I take it that this is what is going on in like trying to find sort of all the avenues you can to give meaning to what you're doing, but all these avenues are blocked by patriarchy and by the meaning that is given and, and how like these endeavors are um, rendered ridiculous by patriarchy. That being said, I think what you were asking Ellie really intersects with what Philippa was asking about the ethical dimension of submission that I didn't really respond to. And I think it's an ongoing conversation I have with some of you and especially with Philippa now uh, about what is the normative power of submission? Because I take it that the way I had conceived of my work was to say, we always jump to the conclusions of blaming submissive women for their submission. And before we do that, and, and we always agree that submission is bad. And so I think we, we rush into the normative work. And before we rush into this normative work, we should take a step back and look at the descriptive work. And one of the reasons for that, of course, has to do with my own situation as a French woman who sees how submission is weaponized for the racist post-colonial agenda against um, Muslim women, right? That the whole idea in France is to say, Oh yeah, like, and, and I saw it when I was doing my dissertation on women's submission, everyone was saying, oh, you work on women and the veil or you work on Muslim women. And there was constantly, and, or I can imagine how in the US now people, um, like there's a racist trope like that about Asian women, right? About like, and we've seen it in racist crimes against Asian women that they're seen as the perfect submissive women. And so in the case of anti-Asian women racism, their submission is seen as something great. Whereas in the case of Muslim women in France, their submission is seen as something problematic. But in both these cases, submission is weaponized. And so I, before we weaponize it, I wanted to take a step back and try to look at what submission is. Because I do believe that there's an emancipatory um, effect of description of oppression. And so, and, and it's something I've experienced with my book. I think my book, especially in the French version, that was because French people are more used to reading philosophy when they're not philosophers. It really reached a, a general audience. And I keep receiving even now or seeing on, on Instagram, people who talk about like my book and what it did for them. And what is very clear is that it did a sort of consciousness raising in the form of what McKinnon talks about of say, of giving a word to unify a lot of experiences that a lot of women were like, oh, okay. So actually what I think is just my dieting and what I think is just uh, what I like in bed and what I think is just uh, my relationship with my children has a unifying thread that is submission. So it's, it's really the same old, uh, the, the, the personal is political kind of thing. But of course, I think, and I, I take it that Beauvoir is somewhat doing the same thing as me and somewhat, or I'm doing the same thing as her, of course, but what I mean is that we're stuck in the same situation that it looks like to describe what's going on, you need to suspend your judgment uh, in the sense of normative judgment 
but of course you would not endeavor to study women's submission if you thought women's submission was great and so of course I personally see women's submission as having to do with mystification, as having to do with false consciousness, as having to do with, you know, what economists talk about, about like um, irrationality where you have skewed preferences towards the president. I think this is really what's going on that, and, and you see it, I, I think you see it about women and age, right? Like when you see how, when you're a young woman, it's so tempting to play the young ethereal version of femininity that like femininity and youth have to do with each other. And, and you see these women being very, uh, and, and I, mean, I wanna say, you see us being playing by the rules of seduction and being so happy. And, and we know deeply when we do this, that comes an age where this will mean that you're erased, that this pleasure taken in a certain form of femininity is the other side of the same coin of the fact that older women tell you that people physically walk into them because they don't even see them. And, and so I think we need to think about like the ageism at the heart of the pleasure in submission and, and so for all these reasons, of course, it's, it's very hard to um, suspend your judgment <clears throat> about submission. And I'm not sure I would want to. So I'm, I'm stuck there. I, I agree with you, uh, Philippe. I think that's a problem of when I'm, I'm trying to say, oh, I'm not like doing no normative work. Of course, I have normative convictions about about this and, and they appear sometimes. Yeah, and I'll, ju I'll just say it, it, it's a, one of the things that I think is emerging is that even, you know, I, I think you, your book does a really great job of sort of laying out a lot of methodological considerations that are really important in this question of like holding together the structure and the individual, right, is um, something that's going to give us perhaps even a sort of not a, a vision of submission, but of submissions, right? Um, so what you were just saying about age, um, it strikes me that the relation between individual and structure is something that has this historical um, sort of dimension, right? And our relation to social norms and our reflection on our relation with social norms changes a lot with age. Um, in fact, that's probably why, you know, talking to older women, talking to the younger generation who is sort of now, um, you know, starting to read Beauvoir in universities and, and things like that. It's That's why it's there's something, um, uh, uh, there's something interesting there, um, or especially interesting there, because um, some of these delights, as I, I like that you use that delights of passivity um, expression so much, I think it's so, so apt. These delights really sort of change over time and, and, and have a, a, a really sort of a diachronic dimension to them and, and are something we reflect a, you know, over time. So there's, there's, there's a bit of a call here for a, a kind of, um, you know, conversation between generations as well and between people over time um, as well in thinking about this individual structural relation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this, um, this raises the issue of Beauvoir and intersectional analysis, because I think in a way, I, I hadn't really thought about it that way until I read Amiens Srinivasan's work, uh, book. And, and I think what a lot of us are trying to do, or at least what I'm trying to do, is try to rethink the problems of the second wave feminists with the um, very valid critique criticisms that were raised by the third uh, wave 
feminists. So I think there's a sort of going back to the questions of embodiment, sexuality, phenomenology, not that people stopped. I mean, without Sonia Crook, Sarah Inama, and I don't know, Jack, Jen McQueenie, we would not be here. So like these are works that really uh, defined our work, but I think we're we're just, there's a call to go back to these topics with sometimes a complete an awareness of how they've been the topic of so many books in the 70s, right? Um, but with the knowledge of the question of intersectionality. And so I think for me, like these, these methodological conundrums, it's, it's almost apparatic. Like I think with submission, you are talking for people who cannot talk and that's unavoidable and that's also extremely dangerous. And I think this question, if submission works, then real submissive women, like, or that there are some submissive women who cannot talk and there's nothing we can do. Well, there are things we can do politically about this, but what we can do in terms of trying to understand their experiences has the, very big problem that they're not the ones who are talking. But Ellie, I think you were right that we should maybe open to other people um, and questions. I don't know how you want to proceed if you want to. Uh, so the, the first question that was asked uh, came from Sarah Cohen Shabu. I don't know if you've seen it in the chat yeah. box. Uh, I think she's gone now, but she uh, yeah. wanted to know if you would talk about how uh, submission is different from uh, the non phenomenon of bad faith. So, first of all, I take it that Bobar is not completely clear about what bad faith is when she gives up, when she opposes Sartre, because it be, she says uh, it's bad faith to try to pretend you're not a woman, but it's also bad faith to, so, so there seems to be that through her concept of situation, the notion of bad faith completely changes to the extent that, um, in a way, going with the flow of your situation is not seen as bad faith anymore. Like accepting your facticity is not completely bad faith. I'm not sure that she would say that a woman who's been raised as a woman who had the experience of puberty that she describes of being a body for others before being a body for oneself, etc., is really in a is is a morally responsible for saying I do this because I'm a woman right and at the same time she would want this person to know that she has freedom but I feel like in the second sex she I, I had looked I think she uses the term nine times or eight times over nine well I should ask um I think Connie and, and Sheila are here so they would know better than me but it's actually not a central concept of the second sex, precisely because once you take the structural approach seriously, it becomes very hard to understand what bad faith is. And I think that Beauvoir wants to take seriously the fact that some women really know what they're doing and, and it is a cost benefit analysis. And that's uh, the metaphor that I use because I think Pova was a great hiker and that I think one submission has to do with uh, you're on the hike and there's the path in front of you that has all the painted marks that tell you this is the right way to go. Many hundreds of people have walked this path before so it's it's accessible, but you can also decide to go straight up in the middle of the bushes and the stones and etc. And I think that when you're a man, the path that is 
perfectly prepared for you is the is a path of freedom and when you're a woman the path that is prepared in front of you is a path of submission so yes you can cut through and decide to do something differently but there's still the fact that the costs of trying to do so are so high and bad faith is pretending that the costs are not going to be that high that you're just finding refuge or at least bad faith in the sort of Sartrean sense. And so I take it that Beauvoir would not see submission as, as bad faith, neither do I. I think it's more something of a negotiation with the state of a patriarchal world. Thanks. Um, a second que question uh, went from Lillian Barger. She's asking, isn't the issue of submission one of power? Some women might see submission as a form of power in this society. Yes, of course. But the question is to know. So that's one of the things that I um, defend in my book that I say, of course, um, it is a form. It is the form of power that women have. And so I think that responds to another question that was asked about uh, Bourdieu's work on masculine domination. Because I think Bourdieu in masculine domination has a very good example about Mediterranean women um, who are really, uh, I mean, he doesn't describe it exactly like that, but I, I see my grandmother so hard in his description that I think I invested this description, but that, this whole thing of um, guilt tripping everyone, you know, that you say, oh, I've served you my whole life and this is how you treat me and uh, no one loves me in this family and I worked so hard for them, for you. And that the reaction you have to this is wanting to leave. Is it not, you feel guilty, but that makes you reject the person. And so Bourdieu talks about this as the fact that the sort of freedom that women have is a freedom to be seen as terrible and invasive and, and that the, the, the power of submission is a power that pushes everyone away from you. And you see it in the mandarins as well. And you see it in the femme rompu that this sort of whole narrative of, you see, I gave you everything. I renounced everything for you. The, the result of this is that the person rejects you even more. And so it does uh, stuck, uh, yeah, it, it makes women stuck in this, in this situation. So there's something structural about that position. So I think that's the thing is that submission is a form of power, but I do, I am wary of all these people who say, no, no, but you know, uh, women actually, they have all the power. You see, it, you see it in the working class. It looks like they're victims of this and that, but actually they're the ones historically who have the salary and who just give an allowance to the men and they rule over the house. But ruling over the private sphere is not the sign that you're the one who has power because you, and, and that's what Beauvoir really shows that you're not the one who has the power of seeking meaning and creating meaning. And so that means you don't really have power. Thank you. Um, Javier Poveda, do you want to speak your question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was very enlightening. So my question goes from uh, the point of view of the actual times. Don't you think that maybe um, Pebois is someone important for our times because we are kind of living uh, some similar situations like where in the pre, in, sorry, uh, in the first half of this, of the, of the 20th century, right? So we have, for example, um, I think that we are in a stage of an economic system and which is kind of like very unstable. It's not a very stable system right now. There's some, kind of problems. And then we, I am seeing some patterns, well, as a historian, and some things are happening. And Bebois wrote what he wrote uh, in those conditions, right? In a very unstable system in some way. 
if I am not quite sure, because she's she's actually someone who comes from a who comes from the post-war years. So it, she's mostly like to understand these things. But when she lived, uh, her her living was more in an unstable system, right? And we are kind of in an unstable system, not as strong as was in the first half of the 20th century, but kind of now we are living in something very strong. So I don't know if you see that maybe um, these late times of, of the economic system derives from the submission of women, because we have the advances of the 60s and 70s that were kind of very strong, and we are kind of uh, in a reduction of this, uh, of these rights. Yeah, so that's a that's a good question to wonder what historically makes Beauvoir Beauvoir, and if it can explain why she's so relevant today. I actually, the more I read her, I I may be wrong, and I would be curious to know what like the many Beauvoirians here think. The more I read her, the more I think that, yes, the experience of the war really shaped her. But the ethics of ambiguity is 1947. It seems to me that biographically, the thing that really changed everything in her feeling like she has no other choice than to understand oppression was both a structural and an individual lens is her trip to the US. And I do think more and more that the influence of Wright, of Du Bois, of Myrdal, of what she saw in the American South was in a way even stronger than the war on her because the war made her a bit like lyrical about we all share this world together and and at the end of the day we all have the same freedom and then she arrived in the american south and when you read her journal um l'américo jour le jour you see her diary you see that everything she sees is that we don't have the same freedom we're not a we we're like there is like the, the social, economic, racial situation changes everything. And therefore, yeah, I'm more and more convinced. I mean, I, I'm not the first one, like Meryl just commented and I mean, Meryl wrote, wrote about this to some extent in some way and Margaret Simmons and so many people are, are writing about this, but I, I think it's not, so I'm not sure that what we're living right now is what make, um, makes Beauvoir relevant in terms of um, the economic situation, but more in terms of how, we're both at a time of extreme individualism and at a time where this extreme individualism hits a wall constantly. And, and that like women can lead in all they want. They can be, uh, uh, they can try to have it all and, and et cetera. And they still get harassed and they still get sexually assaulted and they still get um, uh, like killed and raped and, and so, yeah, I think that's that's more what is going on now that we see, well, indi individualism doesn't work. Um, but yeah, so so I think I Meryl, I so I, I don't know if you all see the chat, but I, I agree with Meryl. Of course it's both. Of course, like the occupation made her aware of the collective and and her reaction to to Hegel had something um, when she says like she loves Hegel, but it's like uh, a sort of uh, a world that has nothing to do with the real world compared to to Kierkegaard uh, to Heidegger. I think that's true, but in the second sex, I I think that she's so 
stricken by injustice in, in the US. And so Elaine, um, I agree with you that the Algerian war was very significant, but the Toussaint Sanglant is the 1st November 1954. So it becomes a very big issue over time and, and she becomes very aware of it with Fanon and, but when the book is published in 1949, the Algerian war, like there's a, she's among the few people who knows that there are bad things going on in Algeria, but the Algerian war is 10 years after the second sex. So it's, it, but I agree with you that it's absolutely very significant with her later texts, but not with the switch between the ethics of ambiguity and the second sex. Kyla has a hand raised, maybe, no? Yes, Kyla. Hi, yeah, sorry, I'll just turn on my video one second. Hi, thank Hi. you very much. Um, I have, there was something that I just, I just got your book. I've not done it, but it only came a couple of days ago. So um, I did. I'm not read expecting something. people to know everything. Uh... It wasn't the homework. <laughs> um, so I did read something that I just loved, um, and I highlighted it because I'm a good student. So um, you wrote that one needs considerable confidence in the legitimacy of one's place in the world in order to have the ambition or the pretension even necessary to creation. And I really like that really stuck with me because I was thinking about um, like based on what I've read for, in this book and what I've read in Beauvoir, um, the relationship between creativity and then its opposite kind of like negation and the sort of activities that we participate in when we perform uh, femininity and, and we do the whole submission thing has a lot to do with negation. Um, so, you know, cleaning things or tr trying to diet to slim down to look like an ideal. These are all things that like erase dirt or erase your physical presence in the world or your uniqueness. Um, so I was just curious about if you have any thoughts on the relationship between um, submission and it enacted and like the actions being ones towards negation versus creativity and maybe creativity being something we can kind of aspire to do in our actions instead of more act activities that maybe just cause less stuff, non-creative things, <laughs> thank you. No, of course, that's a very good question. Thank you. I, I think there is also, there is, of course, this opposition between creativity and negation, but we go back to this question of meaning, right? Um, why do we think of um, cleaning? So I think, for instance, if everyone, the reality is, if we don't want to, uh, externalize cleaning, therefore reproducing racial inequalities and class inequalities, then it just means that everyone has to clean. And so that we have to realize that it's not that we're just uh, queens of our households or that like we have uh, the best tips. So even if you don't have the best tips, Ellie, you, <laughs> you have to, it's, I mean, we all have to clean. And so the ambiguity of our existence is that there is a part of it that is just a negation of the forces that would negate our existence and some creative parts. And so the question is, how do we find this balance? How do we change things so that it's not, there is not a gender division of life where men do creativity and uh, women do um, negation of, uh, of the wrongs of life. I was told recently by a very powerful woman who's married to a very smart academic. Uh, she's also an academic and she's very accomplished, but she explained that 
her husband being a genius, he doesn't do groceries because uh, it's a bad use of his time. But she's, I mean, she's a full professor and she she was for a long time a dean. She's not Nancy Bauer. So I'm, uh, because I know that that's the dean that everyone knows, but she was a dean. She's not at all a philosopher, but she was saying he can't get groceries, but they have three kids, you know? And so you're know, like, well, now the kids are old, but how the question is, how is it that her creativity had to be on only a very small amount of time because the rest of the time she had to clean and do groceries and, and do shopping. And he had the luxury to be like, oh no, creativity, that's my thing. Negation of uh, the dangers of like filth, etc. That's not my thing. You know, it's like the guys who say, oh no, I, I don't change diapers. I don't, you know, like, well, diapers need to be changed. And so I think that's the question is also, how do we live in a world where we think this there can be a gender division of this? But then there is a the question of what meaning do we give to what? Why do we think that women who cook meals every day, it's not a project and something creative, but chefs, it's something creative. So why so there is also a gendered evaluation of things of how what is creativity is it creativity like no one would say that 50 shades of gray is creativity or maybe some people would and I think they should but a lot of people say oh no it's not Balzac huh? but I mean really sometimes you read Balzac and I mean he writes better than Yale James but a lot of these questions these these topics are the same and you know so why is yell james just uh like mommy porn and and balzac is literature you know so there is this as well norman quist Okay, uh, you're you're muted. We don't hear you. You're muted. Okay, we we can't hear you, Norman. Oh. Your your mic is muted. Oh. Well, in in okay, the meantime, you can yeah yeah. In the meantime, um, we, maybe we can take a question that is written in the chat box. So LG Mayer does not that come back to a question of to whom these feminized bodies are submitting. Um, is the idea being that the submission is only acceptable when it is directed towards Anglo-European man, otherwise it's another form of resisting white supremacy. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's one of the questions, right, about typically the Muslim veil, that you can see it as a form of um you can see it as a form of submission, but then when you're aware of the history of French colonialism, where women in Algeria were forced to take off their veil by the colonial administration, then veiling yourself was a form of resistance to the colonial state. And there, and there was also a form of, there can be seen as, it can be seen as a form of resisting the imperative of showing your body and your sexiness to men and, and a sort of, uh, if you force the mini skirt on me, like I can also decide to not show my body. So this kind of, uh, of course, uh, what we deem to be good submission is, or not we, but what is deemed by popular culture, et cetera, is the kind of submission that make Anglo-European men happy. Um, Norman, if you wanted to ask your question and unmute yourself. No. Um, 
So do you have any thoughts about the role we play as women in policing each other's femininity submission or encouraging each other to participate in submission? Well, I think that's, of course, one of the very big question, right? And so I think that can be linked up to the question of to whom are we submitting? And of is submission a form of power that I think you could imagine it's, a, it's an extreme case, but you could imagine a relationship in which the woman submit to the man without the man dominating the woman because actually the woman submits to patriarchy. And so even if her partner in a heterosexual relationship, even if the partner were to be like, I don't want you to do anything on the, best, on the basis of what you think uh, I expect of a woman, I love you. Like, I don't expect anything of you as a woman. I just like want you to be you. And like, still you can, uh, want to make yourself thin, look thinner and be embarrassed about like not being like thin enough during sex or not being a good enough cook or not having a clean enough house. And that of course there's the, the problem with women's submission is that it's both a submission to patriarchy and a submission to uh, men. And so I think to individual men. So it's both an individual phenomenon, a, a phenomenon happening between individuals and between the individual and society. Thank you, Manon. Um, is there an, any other question before we end the session? Okay. Uh, so thank you. Oh, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, yeah, so thank you all for this uh, impressive and enriching conversation. It has personally given me a lot to think about individually, but also in terms of um, of Beauvoir studies. And I'm sure it did for everyone today. Uh, so thank you, Manon. Thank you, Eli. Thank you, Philippa, uh, for being uh, a part of this. Um, before letting you go, I just want to announce uh, the next session if you... Um, Allow me, let me see. Can I just, while you look, I just say a, a word. I'm really grateful to um, everyone for attending, but mostly, but even more to Philippa and Ellie for taking the time to read my work. I know how busy we all are and to engage with it. And it really, it means so much to me. Like, as I said, I really um, respect you a lot. And when Marine, uh, said, who do you want to talk with? I was like, Ellie and Philippa, I would love to hear their thoughts. And so I'm, I'm very, very honored that you took the time and that, yeah, thank you so much. I hope to reciprocate whenever you need. Thank you. No, truly such a pleasure. Um, really an honor to be invited by, by you and the, and the Beauvoir webinar series to do this. And I, I would have been delighted to like think about the book in detail anyway and read it all, you know, but um, this was a great excuse to talk about it with others. So, and Philippa, great to hear your thoughts too. Likewise, I think I just got to say I'm a big fan of the webinar series. So it was great to, to be part of this and to be part of a discussion of a book that I have found so thought provoking. And I think this discussion has only brought out more questions about you know, power and creativity that I'm just like, ah, need to go think about this now. So <laughs> thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Manon, Ali, and Philippa. Um, so yeah, before letting you go, I, I just want to announce the next session. Um, it will take place on uh, May 13th. Um, we'll have the pleasure to welcome Jean-Louis Janel, Julia Corbic, and uh, Sandrine Sanos. Uh, they will be uh, in conversation with Emma McNichol to talk about the stakes in uh, writing uh, Beauvoir's life. Uh, if you want to receive a certificate of attendance, uh, please fill out the evaluation form that uh, Gina um, is going to share with you in the chat box. And uh, thank you again to our three speakers, to the audience for your amazing question and for your participation. And uh, Gina and I hope to see you uh, very, very soon. Thank you.
Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.